Okay, so, hello, my name is uh, Felix Simonis. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Chair of Scientific Computing. And uh, today I'm going to present you a bit what we are breaking uh, in Precess version 3. So, um, last, uh, last release, Benjamin wrote that um, an iceberg is uh, on the horizon. And uh, so this talk is a bit of a basic survival guide for that. Um, yeah. So in general, there we um, saved a lot of, of things for version 3 because we, uh, never, we decided to never ever break backwards compatibility unless we really have to. And um, so there's quite a lot to do and we already did quite a lot for this version, as you can see. And um, so the following, I'll just go through things that we changed, mainly in the API and in the configuration, so things that you will be impacted with. And uh, yeah, so some things are already done, some things are work in progress, and some things are discussion in progress, and it is uh, especially important that we are always open to feedback, and if you, are, if you very strongly uh, do not agree with something, we can talk about this, right? So feel free or feel invited. So the first thing is that you want to get rid of this solvent interface thingy. Um, as you can see, here we have an example of the Python bindings. Here we don't even use the name solvent interface anymore. Here we just use interface. And it's always quite confusing. Uh, so from our perspective, we will always talk about participants and how they are uh, decoupled from each other and so on. But then if you look at the code itself, we often talk about solver interfaces and interfaces and sometimes they're called precise and it is uh, just sometimes a bit confusing. So we decided to ramp this a bit and to actually change the name to what we are talking about and we're going to change this to participant, right? Because at the end of the day, you say, okay, uh, precise, I want a participant that's called like this, right? So this is what we are moving towards. This is work in progress. Yeah. Another big change that will basically impact everyone um, are IDs and names. Uh, so generally, um, you have, so as a general concept, these slides are based on the course that you did, hopefully on the first day, right? So they should come, they should look familiar in some way and form. So um, generally you have IDs and names, right? So you know, so you give names to specific meshes or data that relies on these meshes or, or solvers, and then you use um, the code that you write or the, the adapter. You then uh, expose these and uh, ask uh, the precise interface to give you IDs or so. And then based on these IDs, you can then write information or write data or spe specify a mesh um, connectivity or things like this. And uh, this has led to some confusion uh, we, so especially in teaching, uh, we sometimes notice that people start to make assumptions based on IDs, which is something that we don't want to do. And we figured out that it is uh, way easier to get rid of this middleman completely and just uh, specify uh, names only. And this was, would look something like this, right? So uh, if you want to specify the meshes for a, verte for an, for a mesh, vertices for a mesh, you would just uh, pass the name, right? The rest is the same. And if you want to uh, write or read uh, coupling data, this is always uh, scoped by a mesh, right? Because the data can live on multiple meshes. Then you would first pass the mesh name and then the temperature. So this is a bit, so meaning that reading and writing data is a bit more verbose, right? Because you have, instead of one ID, you have two names. But um, the big point of this is that when we uh, internally encounter an ID that doesn't really make sense, then that's it. We cannot make any conclusion, take any conclusions on this, and we cannot help you. If you, however, pre present us with uh, some mesh name that's wrong, then we can, can tell you that maybe you did a typo or maybe um, there's something missing in the configuration or something like this. So we can actually provide a proper error message and help and guidance as well. Next part is something that you haven't seen yet, 
uh, that's about specifying, co specifying connectivity. And uh, this has evolved over time. So in general, uh, the idea is here that um, you can specify connectivity for your mesh. So you have vertices, and then based on these vertices, you define edges and so on. And we always had to, so we always had to specify uh, these hierarchically. So if you wanted to specify a triangle, you had to specify edges first, and then pass these to a triangle, which was a pain. And uh, that's where then this shortcut function came into, uh, so was added, right? Now we have this set mesh triangle with edges, which takes vertices, which is now even more confusing than before, right? And um, this is also a bit tricky because we try to avoid duplicate edges and so on. So this is actually quite expensive. And all of this handling of these ideas is, um, is, is just not worth it, and no one wants to do it. So we decided to uh, come up with a different solution. And um, so this is already implemented. Uh, the basic idea is now everything connectivity related is just uh, just works based on IDs, so vertices, right? If you want to specify a triangle, you just try, uh, specify it using uh, using the three vertices and so on. Uh, assumptions that we make is um, that that basically you as a user you specify what you actually need, and we we do like post processing of the mesh and uh, compress it. So we remove duplicates and things like that, right? Um, yeah. So you don't have to do anything in your adapter related to that. The general guideline is um, if you want to specify, um, let's say you want to specify quads, then just specify quads and leave the rest to us. Another thing that you also haven't seen yet is uh, how, to uh, how to specify initial data. Um, so, if you think about this, uh, currently uh, you specify your mesh IDs, so your, your mesh IDs, so basically discretization of your mesh, right? And then you pass on to precise and you do your coupling. Uh, the precise takes the assumption that if you do not specify otherwise, uh, that the initial boundary condition is always zero, right? If you want to specify your own boundary condition or initial boundary condition, you have to uh, specify this in the config and then one of the solvers, or maybe two of the solvers, depending which scheme you use, uh, then has to provide this, right? So if you think about it, if you have a staggered scheme, what one solver sends the first bunch of uh, data, which then gets transferred to the next, and so on. If you have a parallel, a parallel scheme, it, both solvers need to transfer this in the first step, because I have this crossover scheme. Um, this was always a bit uh, tricky, right? Because uh, normally, so the way it, it, it used to work is that you uh, first set your mesh, you initialize, and then internally inside Precise, uh, you get some information that allows you then to uh, query Precise and ask, hey, Precise, do I actually need to fulfill this action here? And this action here is this action writes initial data. And if that's true, then you need to, uh, then you can or need to uh, write the, the data onto the, the mesh and uh, call this mark action fulfilled thingamajig there. And then afterwards, you then call initialize data. And this is a bit convoluted, and it is also not always logical in the way this is uh, phrased around, right? Normally, also, normally, it would be more logical to, to first define your mesh, then define your data, and then uh, initialize, and so, this is something that, that even I, after five years of working on Presa, still got wrong twice while writing the slide. Uh, because the question is also, uh, do I have to call initialize data always? Do I do this uh, conditionally or not? Or things like that. So uh, thanks to, to Benjamin Rodenberg, we now have a very simple solution. Um, we just define the mesh. We Then we ask Presa, uh, or the participant in this case, hey, do I actually need to, uh, to provide initial data for this? Then you write it, and then you call initialize as usual. Right? So all this other stuff is gone. And it's also way more logical, right? So you specify your, your mesh, you specify your data if you need to, and then you continue with uh, the actual coupling logic. OK, and you already saw this before. We had this strange action interface 
maybe I can draw this on here. Does that work? Come on. Yet we had this strange action interface. So, um, yeah, so you would ask, so you, there, there, you, would, you can ask precise if a specific action is required, right? And if this action is required, you then have to mark it as fulfilled afterwards, right? And this is basically just like a string that you can give to precise, and there's also a bit of a tricky thing regarding, of docu regarding documentation, what you can pass on there. And currently we have these, um, this, uh, these constants that you can then query, and there are, I think, three of these at the moment. And this is quite, this is, uh, quite a tricky thing to do, because you can ask as, an, as a user whether you need to do something, Right, but we as we in Precious we have no way of of checking actually if you did this. So uh, you, you promising us by mark action fulfilled doesn't actually mean anything, right? You can just call this and uh, then be done with it, which is something we do for example in our testing a lot as well. Um, yeah, so we decided decided had to go somehow and um, yeah we wanted to simplify all of this and streamline this. The other point is that this is also not very readable, uh, especially if you use something like C++, you have to keep these uh, strange strings around all the time and need, to, need them uh, to be accessible. And uh, this can be very unreadable as well. So what we did is um, we rephrased these as requirements, right? So now you have explicit calls for these. So actually uh, quite uh, easy to use, like Boolean, Boolean calls. Um, the first one here is just that you ask the participant, do I actually need, uh, do I need to write a checkpoint? And if so, then you do it, right? Uh, the, the upside from our point of view is, uh, in precise, we know uh, if you called this or not. So let's say you uh, have an adapter that you write and you decide uh, for, for Jollies to switch it to implicit coupling, then we, we, can, t we can tell, ah, you didn't even call this. So your adapter isn't even ready for this, and we can tell you to go back to adapter and implement this stuff. Um, the other part that that this um, part of this change is that uh, with these requirements, uh, the co the contract basically is now that if you as a user um, ask if you need to do it, and we tell you yes, please do it, and you don't do it, then it's your own fault, right? So it's basically the same as before. Yeah. And this also simplifies all of this and makes it very, very easier to read, yeah, which is especially useful for teaching. Another part um, where I wasn't really sure how to phrase it is that we're moving further towards uh, waveform interpolation. And this is um, regarding these two things here, this uh, is, read data, is read data available and is write, write data required. So if you think about it, um, in the old days of precise, we always had uh, these this, uh, time windows, and at the end of time windows, we would communicate and exchange uh, data and so on, right? Uh, so that, that means that if you do subcycling or smaller time steps or something like this inside a time window, then uh, you really only have new data on the interface at the first a sub time step, right? And this is where this read data available comes in. So you can conditionally like optimize your code a bit and just actually uh, load in new information if you actually have new information on the interface. The same for write data required, uh, where you give it this DT. So you say, okay, I plan or I, I, I would like to make a time step size of this, a time step of this size. And then Precess tells you, okay, you basically reach the end of the time window, so please write new data now. Right. So this is, this is how, it how, it, how it worked. But now with this entire time interpolation stuff, we basically don't have uh, data as such anymore, but we mostly work with interpolants. Right? Even if they are constant, which is a bit boring, but uh, it's still, so you can still sample this interpolant at any time, really, time point in your time window. Right? Uh, so this read data available doesn't fundamentally doesn't make sense anymore. So we basically remove this. And the same the same for what is is write data required. You can always provide more sample points, right? So again, we also got rid of that. Yeah. Another part part is um, that we are what we're thinking about. So this is one of the dis discussion in progress uh, topics here. 
is to simplify access to these uh, time step sizes, especially this maximum time step size. Currently, you have these uh, these two parts here. Hope this works. Yeah, you have the preset dt here, which is your maximum time step size for the first time step that you do, which you get from initialize, and then you get the remainder of the time step or this time step size, uh, the maximum time step size of the next time window from advanced dt, also from advanced, yeah. So the problem is here that uh, often this initialization code is somewhere else and then you need to transfer this somehow over and this is just, uh, this, this is just ugly in, 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 uh, in software terms and also you have this, this precess dt which then uh, basically lives until here, right, where you, where you use it to determine your actual little time step size. And then at the end, you have something that lives to the next loop, etc., etc. So this is just, just, just quite ugly to work with. So what we're considering is instead of uh, passing this uh, or returning this in some of these, these function calls, to move this to a separate function, because Priestess knows, knows this anyhow, right? So, and give you the, the opportunity to call this and, and get this information whenever you actually need, right? And uh, so in that case, we would we would turn here initialize into and advance into like uh, void functions, so it doesn't return anything. Um, and whenever you need the time step size, you would just just ask precise to get to to give it to you, right? And this makes things way easier in, in terms of uh, engineering. The scopes are way smaller, and things get easier to read this way. As I said, this is discussion in progress. You can. Uh, flame this later if you like during the World Cafe. Another part which uh, which we're thinking about, uh, which is uh, a bit controversial uh, inside the preset team as well, is um, to unify uh, the data access. So currently we have uh, read and write functions for uh, block versions, singular versions, as well as scalar versions and vectorial versions. And this is a lot of uh, yeah, duplicate code, code inside uh, precise, and because we always try to put usability first, we try to maintain good error messages, so uh, this forces us to really duplicate a lot, right, so to keep uh, like information of location and, and, and functions uh, in the lock uh, functional. Um, yeah, so our idea is uh, to compress all of this and uh, provide a single a single version, so we either read data or write data. And um, so in this case, again, you would just then pass uh, the name is for mesh and the data itself. The vertex ID is that you want to read the data from. And then internally, we would uh, see, okay, what, what size, so is it a vectorial data, is it a scalar data, and pass and return something in the, at the correct sizing. This is, of course, a bit more error-prone in C++ or something, unless we work with something like spans or so. Um, but it is at least easier to read. Uh, the same for, for white data, then. And um, so one of the, the problems that we are considering is that now it is easier to, to read, and also easier to read uh, as a person, uh, but if you change, uh, for some reason, uh, data types inside of your configuration from scalar to vectorial or something like this, then this will not make sense anymore inside your your actual code, right? Because you use different dimensions, etc. And now the question is, um, is the additional mention of uh, vectorial versus scalar an, an upside because it, it uh, prevents you from calling the wrong thing? Or is it a downside because it's just verbose? And this is something we can also later discuss. Another part um, that I wanted to just uh, mention is that we remove coordinate lookups inside Precise. This is uh, thankfully a bit of an, an, uh, a feature that not many people know. So in general, you have this wor these two worlds, right? You have the solver world and you have the Precise world. And uh, the solver, they expose some kind of points right, in some way or form, and uh, the precise just knows coordinates and these vertices, vertices that it uh, specifies internally, right. So the adapter basically always takes these points 
and extract some coordinates, pass them to Precise, and Precise tells you, okay, the things, these coordinates that you gave me, they now correspond to these vertex IDs, right? And um, so sometimes it can get a, can be a bit challenging to associate now these points with vertex IDs. And one uh, kind of hacky thing in the in the past was that was that you could ask Precise, please give me vertex IDs for the specific coordinates, right? So you can so you can use basically Precise as a lookup table, also as a lookup for for these uh, these coordinates and get the vertices, uh, the, the vertex, the vertices that are that correspond with these. However, this is tricky to implement for us um, because if we wanted to implement it correctly, uh, you would be able to interleave it with, uh, let's say, set, mer set, set mesh vertex calls, right? So um, this is uh, tricky because then we need to update like spatial indices to keep this efficient. And um, if we don't do this, what we currently do is uh, we have like an, an n square algorithm, which is not very nice. Um, so, our decision is to move this responsibility now completely to the adapter. So, the adapter now needs to define some kind of mapping from points, whatever they are, to vertex IDs. And um, with this change also comes a lot of documentation how to do this. Um, if you are lucky enough that your points have some kind of, of internal IDs, so solver IDs of some sort, then you can, can create like a simple mapping. And if you rely on coordinates only, um, then you can use like spatial index uh, tree, which is especially easy in Python. You can just use R tree and stuff the things in there and then uh, query it whenever you need. And uh, this is also already implemented. So Then slowly moving to configuration stuff. We uh, did a lot of clarification uh, of text. Um, you have probably, hopefully, <laughs> used the uh, use mesh tag uh, before. And this can can but can uh, get a bit uh, confu confusing very quickly, if, especially if you look up the reference for this thing. Um, problem here is that you have a tag that does multiple things, right? And um, the most of the, the biggest problem is that most uh, of these attributes they do not they are not always valid, right? So many of them um, many of them uh, they they depend strongly on this provide toggle, right? So this is uh, just messy because we have to check it and we cannot really give you proper information and so on and so forth. And we need to rely on documentation instead of having this uh, readable in the first place. Uh, the second part is sometimes you, you, you have things like this multi-coupling scheme where we again, we have some toggles, right? And uh, like a basic idea that we do now in the in is try to remove these strange toggles and convert them to something that's actually readable, right? Uh, what we do, for example, in, uh, for version 3, which is also work in progress, uh, is the first thing we, we split this uh, use mesh into provide mesh, which is now just uh, the name, right? And receive mesh. So now we don't have these clashes of various uh, invalid uh, attributes anymore. This is already implemented. And the second part here is that, for, for example, for multi coupling schemes, you, can, um, you have to specify controller anyhow, right? And uh, in this case, you uh, would call it a controller. Uh, then I uh, I will just skip over the RBF, the new RBF mappings and the the changes of as David already talked about them. And uh, we have two new uh, RBF functions, right? So we we had the the, the Vendlands uh, C0 and uh, C6, and now we also have the C2 and C4. So th these are like this is the list of the RBF functions that we actually support at the moment, in our way of writing them. Another big part are uh, is acceleration. So whenever you start with implicit coupling, like the log logical next step is to uh, add some kind of acceleration to this. And uh, the problem with this is um, often if you go into these um, these uh, quasi Newton uh, acceleration schemes, uh, there you are basically you have a wall of uh, options that you need to go through, read up, and so on. Um, but what you're really just interested in is the, are the first two lines, right? Especially if you start. So what we try to come up with um, is this, right? Provider with uh, some kind of defaults, 
for, for uh, the majority of things, so that at least you don't have to specify everything anymore. And uh, this is again, so the goal of this is of course teaching, right? It makes it way easier to, to, to start, right? Then we come to coupling schemes. Um, this may look a bit uh, cryptic, but um, uh, I have to talk about this uh, for, for specific reasons. Um, so if you want multi-coupling of some sorts, so couple multiple solvers, you would just define uh, the various coupling schemes in your configuration, right? So in this case, uh, I have a solver that I call this. So this solver is coupled to another A, so parallel explicitly coupled to another A and then serially, serially implicitly coupled to another B, and parallel explicitly coupled to another C, right? And uh, what Precise currently does is, for each solver, it uh, treats these in order of definition in the config, right? So it would first, do the, it would first couple to, to A, then B, then C, and treat them in this order. What we did now in um, version three is that we changed this order so that it will always run all explicit schemes first, and then all implicit schemes, right? So now the order that you specify in the config does not align 100% with the order that uh, these things will run in. Uh, the other part is uh, our multiple implicit coupling schemes. So uh, this is something that was always possible in, in precise and you can, could, you could even interleave implicit schemes with explicit, sch explicit schemes and they would be treated in order which um, doesn't really make sense. Um, and now we forbid this. So for one solver, uh, you're only allowed to specify one single implicit scheme. And um, this sounds like a limitation, but in fact, this is exactly why we have the multi-coupling scheme, right? So basically what you do now is you group all the, 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 the solvers that you want to implicitly coupling, couple into a single uh, multi-coupling scheme, right? And if you want to know uh, the reason why and uh, read up on this, there's a paper that came out actually quite some time ago, uh, out quite some time ago, um, about the reasons behind this, uh, including studies of uh, why multiple implicit schemes are not really uh, numerically meaningful. Okay, and then finally, something, uh, so this is my topic and I try to push this now and maybe get it into version three. Uh, are dynamic meshes. So uh, the way we hope to implement this, or especially I hope to implement this, is that now with the provide mesh tag, right? you just say, okay, I'm a participant solid, I provide this mesh, but I also uh, reserve the right to reset it. So you can specify this explicitly as being dynamic. And the rest is all the same. So uh, the rest you don't need to, to, to touch. right? And then in your in your coupling uh, logic or in your coupling loop, you would normally uh, do some kind of evaluation whether you actually have to remesh of some sort, right? So evaluate some criteria or something like that. So you have to do this, uh, if I need to remesh, right? And if that's true, then you just call, uh, you just tell the participant to reset the mesh, right? So then it's blank and you can specify new vertices write information to these vertices again and continue with the coupling, right? So this is the fundamental idea. How this will end up in practice uh, is tricky. Uh, so uh, things like uh, how does this inter interfere with uh, or interact with the waveform? Now we have samples that uh, correspond to different locations and things like this. And how does this uh, affect acceleration? So there are still open questions but the, the basic framework is uh, about ready for this now. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, you took something away. And if you're angry now, then we can talk about this during the, the World Cafe. <laughs>
that's actually a very good question, and I thought about this this morning as well. So uh, we have to check this again. <laughs> yeah. This might reduce the need to write your own adapter config. You can just ask. The yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> it's a trick question. Okay. Uh, say I want to port my adapter now to the new version. Should I go through your slides to port it, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, if I now want to report my uh, port my adapter from version two to version three, should I go to the slides, or are there other, other uh, is there anything else? And yes, this is a very tricky question. Um, so yes, so this is uh, this shows the examples. Um, so this, as I said before, this is like your survival kit, right? But uh, we have a complete list of um, things that you need to do for for porting. We normally have porting guides between the versions, and um, we are thinking about uh, creating tools, uh, so a bit like the Python two to three, that uh, like at least pause your configuration without having to go through everything. But it is relatively straightforward especially if you don't have to do that for 100 tests or so. Yeah. If you want to try out version 3, is there any way you can do that today? Okay, so the question is, um, if, you can, if you want to try out version 3, if you can do this today, um, yes, you can just use our develop branch, and uh, this is the current state. So that's the state where we're currently scrubbing along the iceberg, if you think about that. Yeah. yeah. Are there some other plans for other releases of the two series before the uh, The question is, are there plans for other version 2 releases before version 3? And the answer is no. So we decided to heartbreak now. Uh, however, if we run into extremely critical things, then of course we will do another uh, patch or so. But the intention is to uh, to leave it at this now, so no more future releases of sorts. Yeah. Yep. When will version three be released? <laughs> um, Benjamin asks uh, when version when when uh, version three will be released, and uh, as as an uh, like as the overview guy, I think he is in the best position to answer this question. <laughs> Answer a question with a question. <laughs> yeah. We're hoping for the summer. <laughs> so we're hoping for the summer. Yeah. On purpose, we've not fixed the date yet. <laughs> <laughs> Purposefully given a three month window kind of thing. Any other questions? Uh, will the 2.5 still be maintained after the release of the So, um, the question is, will 2.5 still be maintained? And uh, our pragmatic answer to this is, uh, given our funding situation, no. <laughs> so if you want uh, this to be maintained in the future, uh, talk to your boss. And um, yeah, we have support licenses, so maybe that's an, also an interesting part of that. But uh, we don't have the manpower to maintain uh, releases. But our policy for this is that we always keep backwards compatibility as, as well as possible and make like, like shifts as smooth as uh, humanly possible. Yeah, so we always encourage to upgrade. I, I guess maybe I just want to make a comment on that and half question to, to Frederick on that, is that also even though Precise moves to version 3, there are also new versions of software that comes out like OpenForum and Calculix, for example, so those new versions also maybe need adapters for version 2.5 and version 3, and then it depends at what point do you stop updating the adapters for version 2.5 and go to just version 3. And then you kind of force all users to eventually move on to version 3 as well. So I think that's also an open question how long that gets maintained. Yeah. There was another question? Uh, yeah, so uh, the problem you mentioned with um, the new read function, read mm -hmm. write, which doesn't take a, a data type in the function argument there. 
Is that for all implementations, or is it for the things like Python, which don't actually have script typing? So this is uh, so we always try to keep things consistent, right? So this would be I just use the Python bindings because people are used to them, but we would uh, change this in the the fundamental API and then propagate this through all the the other bindings. Yeah, that's the idea. Which is also the reason why I uh, said that this can be relatively dangerous uh, if you use something like uh, C++ because in our case we just use pointers for this, right? So if you change suddenly from scalar to vectorial data, then uh, you uh, yeah you need a um, sanitizer. <laughs> yeah. um, just a suggestion: if your function takes us like an initial argument, like where you want to store the data, instead mm -hmm. of like saying x is equal to interface read, it's like interface read in the first arguments where you're writing it, you could type check based on that. Yeah. So. Um, that was a suggestion on how to implement a type check, right, inside the... Yeah, so the point is um, we in Precise, we know the types anyhow, because if you think about it, if if you asked, also if you used the wrong wrong thing, so if you use a scalar write, write read for vectorial data, we already have to check if uh, you're calling the correct thing. So we all have to, we have the information, so we can also deduce this internally, right? That's what you meant, right? Uh, no, well, more like if you're writing Python and you say, okay, my fluxes are equal to this, but the data type on the size has changed from a scalar to a vector. Yeah. Then when you read that in your Python, you'll, for example, now have vector data when you were expecting scalar, so your code breaks. Yes. But if your data is already like a pre-allocated array, pass that into the function and it's like a vector data structure. Mm -hmm. If you want to write a scalar to that, you could have a runtime error that just scales. Yes, that, that's the, the, the big uh, problem. So the, the reason, so the, the solution for this would be to use some kind of span types, right? At least for C, C++. C++. But uh, yeah, we have to, that's why I said it's uh, currently in discussion. We have to come up with something that actually makes sense and is safe. More questions? I think we still have 20 minutes until the World Cafe. Okay. Hmm. Yep. For the, the um, adaptive meshes uh, look like the code that you need to set the whole mesh and then pass all the vertices again. So also to the partial set. Yeah, we, so this is also something of uh, one of these things that we, are, that we have been considering. The point is that um, the way we handle uh, vertex IDs, we would somehow try to keep consistency between this. And this is relatively expensive. And on the other hand, if you do complete remesh, right, then you normally already uh, change the mesh completely in itself. So you would normally do a complete reset, right? Of course, if you do a partial, uh, and if you do a partial a reset, I think that's what you're, or the remesh, I think that's what you're uh, heading for. We are, we are planning something like a tree-based mm -hmm. so because of the uh, area of it, so it's a yeah. file and then directly tell the resource that we have need to reset as well. So the, what I'm thinking about is that uh, adding more is, is always easy. Uh, removing existing ones is very tricky. Yeah. So we could we could do something like um, like unlock the mesh so that you can add more. But uh, if you want to remove them, then then this really then you really run into problems with uh, keeping consistency between between these IDs and so on. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, if there are maybe no more questions, what I can do is, you know, we can give you some time to think about any other questions that you might have. We can also su suggest a short little beer break, drinks break before the World Cafe at 10.30, but then you will not be able to see these slides and get inspired for more questions. Um, but if there aren't any, 
then I suggest we can go outside, chat about the problems, think about it more, and prepare for the World Cafe.